Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless the five red heifers are now in a secure undisclosed location in israel plans include moving them sometime soon to a visitor's center in Shiloh, where the tabernacle of the Lord once stood for nearly 400 years. The book of Numbers explains that ashes of the red heifer are used to purify priests for their service in the temple. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. Its offal shall be burned, for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. These red heifers are now between one and a half to two years old. To replicate the ceremony mentioned in the Bible, they need to be at least three years old. And within that time span, they cannot have a blemish or anything that would disqualify them for the ceremony, even one white or black hair. According to those working on the project, the ceremony of the red heifer needs to be performed on the Mount of Olives and in a place that would have looked directly into where the temple stood. The land I'm standing on, bought 12 years ago, fits both of those standards. It's had to be exactly at the front of place that the priest that made this ceremony can see the holy of the holy place. Rabbi Yitzhak Mamo owns the land here on the Mount of Olives. And we hope that in a year and a half from today, we can make here in this area the ceremony of the red heifer that actually will be the first step to the temple. Mamo says the ceremony needs priests who have not been defiled by touching anything dead. The Temple Institute actually has uh, nine pure priests. They didn't born in hospital, okay, they born at home. Mm -hmm. Because they are priests, so anyway, they don't go to any cemetery. Mm -hmm. And the parents keep them in a situation that they will not get to any cemetery, not going to mm -hmm. any uh, problematic place, and they are pure, mm -hmm. and they are waiting. So we have the priest, we have the red heifer, we have the land, and we have everything ready. We just need to wait another one and a half year. So we believe that uh, it's very likely that the ceremony would happen somewhere in the area of Passover 2024, out to possibility of Shavuot 2024, somewhere in that timeline, the cows would be old enough and it would be the proper timeline for that ceremony. Byron Stinson of Bonnet, Israel, helped find the red heifers in the U.S. He says these would be the first in 2,000 years and that the process toward a third Jewish temple began when the Jewish people started their return to the promised land from the four corners of the world, culminating with Israel becoming a nation. And then in 1948, in one day, they were reborn as a nation and nobody said that could happen. On May 14, 1948, a major Bible prophecy was fulfilled concerning Israel. As we read in Isaiah 66, 8, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. On the evening of May 14, 1948, at precisely 4 p.m., the members of the People's Council in Israel signed the proclamation and the declaration was made that the state of Israel is established. This meeting is adjourned. Israel not only became a nation, but also was literally brought forth as a nation in one day, just as the prophet Isaiah foretold. We move forward and Israel continues to be this strong nation and all of these prophecies start fulfilling. There, there's so many now have been fulfilled. It's just incredible the evidence of, of what God is doing with uh, Jerusalem as the center of that. And the temple is the center of Jerusalem. And so how can it happen and how will it happen? I don't think anyone really knows for sure. Stinson believes the temple is meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. 
You know, in the Bible, it says when Solomon built the first temple, he said, this is a house of worship for all, all nations. That's what the temple is. And I think a lot of people think it's just a Jewish temple, but that's not true. It's for all the nations of the earth. Stinson says they plan to invite everyone to the red heifer ceremony that may take place in Passover 2024. Everything is in place now with the red heifers. As long as they stay pure, one of them stays pure, then we have everything in place, including the priests. Mamo says according to the Jewish sage Maimonides, there were nine red heifers from Moses to the second temple. It's not his way to write, but suddenly he said the tent will make the Messiah. We know that the Messiah will make the tent. Maybe we have the privilege to be one of these people that uh, help the Messiah to do it. So we're waiting. What is the significance of a red heifer in the Bible? And is a red heifer a sign of the end times? According to the Bible, the red heifer, a reddish brown cow, probably no more than two years old, which had never had a yoke on it, was to be sacrificed as part of the purification rites of the Mosaic law. The slaughtering of a red heifer was a ceremonial ritual in the Old Testament sacrificial system, as described in Numbers 19, one through 10. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight, its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its oval shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, he shall bathe in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. The priest shall be unclean until evening, and the one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, bathe in water, and shall be unclean until evening. Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who dwells among them. After the red heifer was sacrificed, her blood was sprinkled at the door of the tabernacle. The imagery of the blood of the red heifer without blemish being sacrificed and its blood cleansing from sin is a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ shed on the cross for believers' sin. Jesus was without blemish, just as the red heifer was to be. As the red heifer was sacrificed outside the camp, in the same way Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. Hebrews 13, 11, and 12 For the bodies of those animals, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Many anticipate the birth of a red heifer because in order for a new temple to function, according to the Old Testament law, a red heifer would have to be sacrificed for the water of cleansing used in the temple. So, when a red heifer is born, which is quite unusual, it might be a sign that the third temple will soon be rebuilt. Daniel 9.27 Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. The Apostle Paul tells us what this abomination shall be one who makes desolate is in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, who, the Antichrist, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Jesus further expounded on what this abomination shall be one who makes desolate is in Matthew 24, 15 through 18. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Scripture plainly tells us that when the Antichrist steps into the soon to be rebuilt third temple and proclaims to be God and demands to be worshipped as God, that the Jewish people are to flee to the mountains and to do so in a hurry. The Apostle John, in a vision, 
again verifies there will be a rebuilt third Jewish temple, as we read in Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. The Bible clearly teaches that a third temple will be built in the future. The first temple was built by King Solomon and was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, and for nearly 2,000 years now it is laid in ruins, with just parts of the temple walls and some of the foundations remaining. Clearly, there needs to be a working, functioning, rebuilt temple for the Antichrist to desecrate. This temple will be taken over as Daniel the prophet foresaw by the lawless one, commonly known as the Antichrist, at exactly three and one half years after the start of the seven year tribulation. This temple will not be the Lord's temple. The glory of God will not inhabit it. The third Jewish temple will be Satan's temple, in which the Antichrist will exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Now to a major development that could affect the direction of the war in Ukraine. We learned this morning that Chinese President Xi Jinping will visit Russia next week to meet with Vladimir Putin in an apparent show of support. This comes on the heels of a mid-air confrontation between a U.S. surveillance drone and Russian fighter jets over the Black Sea. Video released by the U.S. military shows the moments before one of the jets clipped the drone Tuesday, causing it to crash. Chinese officials say Xi will be meeting with Putin from Monday through Wednesday of next week. It will be their first meeting in six months and comes after Xi secured his historic third term as president. This meeting in Moscow also sends a strong message to Washington as tensions between both countries and the U.S. remain high. Chinese President Xi Jinping and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin last met in September 2022. Now, just over a year into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the two world leaders are planning to meet again Monday. Both countries made the announcement Friday, with the Kremlin releasing a statement saying the two leaders will discuss the development of a partnership and will also sign important bilateral documents. This comes on the heels of a report by Politico that Chinese companies have been sending assault rifles, body armor, and drone parts to Russian entities. The shipments took place between June and December of 2022, according to customs data, unconfirmed by CBS News. Just days ago, a Russian fighter jet collided with an unarmed American drone, forcing it to crash into the Black Sea. Video released by U.S. officials Thursday shows the Russians making two passes from behind the drone, dousing it in a cloudy stream of jet fuel before clipping it. To demonstrate uh, publicly uh, uh, what type of actions the Russians had taken, we felt that it was important to provide this imagery. CBS News has learned that those Russian pilots were acting on orders from military leaders. And in another development this morning, Slovakia announced it will join Poland in sending fighter jets to Ukraine in the coming days, making them the first NATO nations to do so. Poland is now the first NATO country to deliver warplanes to Ukraine. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, is on the scene for us with the latest. Poland will be the first country to give fighter jets to Ukraine. An announcement yesterday, the Polish President Duda said four or Soviet-era MiG jets will be delivered to Ukraine in the next few days. They have others to give. They just need to be serviced before they are sent. Now, it's important to say these are some 30 years old. They're nearing the end of their working lives, but they don't need the same amount of training that more advanced planes would. What does this mean for the United States? Well, the White House has said this doesn't affect their calculus. President Biden has already ruled out uh, giving F-16s, but they do say that it is the sovereign decision of each country. And in that vein, Slovakia has this 
this morning said they want to give 13 of these MiG jets. Meanwhile, the Russians are trying to improve their military capability. They say they want to put hypersonic missiles on every one of their submarines. No word yet on when they're going to be able to do that, but these are the missiles that Ukraine cannot defend against. So obviously worrying for this country. And this morning, after a lot of speculation, we now know that President Xi of China will visit Moscow next week. Russia keen to say that this is uh, a show of support. Now, inside Ukraine, both sides continue to exchange heavy artillery fire as they prepare for new offensives. Many civilians are caught in the crossfire. Remy Innocencio visited a village in the south that is often hit by Russian rockets. 70-year-old Natalia Kogut never imagined war would hit her backyard. A gift from Russia, she says. Debris from a Grad rocket. Like these, fired from Russian-controlled Ukrainian territory. A roof in tatters, a door blown from its hinges, a wall demolished. Kogut lives just next door. When this house was hit, what did you feel? What happened? Big explosions. The earth was shaking, and so was my house. At about 7 a.m. when this home was hit, luckily there was no one inside. But not every family, not every household was lucky in this village. Victor Carlin and his wife Luba, both 44, lost their lives. Now orphaned, their teenage daughter Snezhana and her seven-year-old brother in intensive care. This far-removed farming village has no apparent strategic value. Since the war started, half of this village's 600 people have fled. Their children spirited away, mostly elderly left behind. Victor and Luba are the first deaths in this community, caught between two armies. How do you want them to be remembered? Bright, says Elizaveta Rudkovich. The whole village respected them so much. For me, they were the best. Life is fragile and death random, here on the edge of war. Luke 2125, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. No president, no government, and a police force without any power. There are now armed gangs in charge of the capital. Haiti is described by its residents as hell on earth. Now the call is rising for a special international force to intervene in the anarchy. Haiti's reputation as a failed state is growing. In January, its last 10 elected senators stepped down, leaving the Caribbean country without a functioning government. The result is anarchy as armed and violent gangs rule the streets. Jimmy Cherizier, whose street name is Barbecue, is known as Haiti's most powerful and feared gang leader. His G9 gang took control of this Haitian fuel depot late last year, while it caused even more misery in a place already described by residents as hell on earth. With little to no organized government, Haiti's embattled police force is virtually powerless. In January alone, 15 cops died battling the gangs. That sparked violent protests from the police themselves. We need a revolution. We need to have a bloodbath. We're in the streets to fight for our brothers and sisters who are victimized by the bandits. And we have to take to the streets every day to get what we want. Protests are heating up in Greece as citizens continue to express their anger over a deadly train accident that killed 57 people. Video from Athens shows a police crane vehicle barreling through bins that were wheeled into the street. A bin appears to knock over a protester. Protesters clashed with police outside of parliament. Reports say some in the crowd threw explosive devices at law enforcement officers who fired back with tear gas. It's estimated that 60,000 Greeks participated in demonstrations against the deadliest train disaster in their nation's history. 
Turning now to France, where President Emmanuel Macron has invoked extraordinary powers to bypass the lower house of parliament and force through a plan to raise the country's official retirement age. The move was met with anger on the streets, and that's putting it lightly, where thousands of people took part in demonstrations. Police clashed with protesters as angry workers took to the streets within minutes of the government forcing through unpopular pension reforms. They will see the retirement age raised from 62 to 64. As night fell, some protesters lost no time setting them on fire. The unions have called for stepped-up strikes and more protests. They say they won't stop until the reforms are dropped altogether. Across Paris tonight, protests against French President Emmanuel Macron. Hours after two no-confidence motions were filed against his government, protesters gathered at the Place de la Concorde, starting a massive bonfire, <laughs> clashing with police as they cleared the square. On Thursday, the reaction was swift, after President Macron and his prime minister forced the unpopular pension reform bill through parliament without a vote. The bill raises the retirement age from 62 to 64 years old, and Macron argues it's essential to prevent the pension system from running out of money. Now the only solution is to show that uh, the people uh, protest against this law, and uh, this is the only solution we have. In recent weeks, eight national strikes interrupting everything from gasoline to transportation to garbage collection. All across the city, everywhere you look, the consequences of the strikes are obvious. And out here, protesters say every single night, this is their fight for democracy. And tonight, President Macron facing a backlash that could bring down his government. All right, Lester, this is what's happening right now on the Place de la Concorde. Police are trying to clear the protesters, and protesters say they will stay out on the street until the no-confidence vote, which will likely happen on Monday. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title, will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. Tornado sirens blaring across Fort Worth, Texas. The wall of a car dealership in Irving crumbling in the storm. I looked up and you could see it was coming from this way and then this one was coming this way. It just like quadrupled in, in intensity with the uh, storm. The slew of worn storms crossing major interstates right in the heart of the evening commute. Pelting them with huge hail, some as big as baseballs. The wind flipping this truck. Thankfully, the two people inside were okay. As the storm raked the cities, power flashes illuminating the sky. All right, here we go. This is the only way Teresa Garcia can get around to feed her animals and retrieve any of her belongings. A river burst its banks and flooded this rural town in central California on Thursday. People here say the fast-moving flood water destroyed everything in its path within minutes. We're shocked that all this happened as quick as it did. So now we're all, you know, we don't know what we're going to do because it, evidently we're not going to be able to come back here and live anymore. So we're going to have to just take our losses. In Southern California, some in the coastal city of San Clemente were forced to leave their apartments as the earth slid away from their backyards. At least 35 out of 58 counties are on a presidential emergency declaration for areas hard hit by natural disasters. The United States West Coast is facing an unusually wet season after two decades of drought. It's endangered lives, destroyed homes and turned roads into rivers. There have been power outages too, and with rain in the forecast, there's likely to be more flooding in the next few days.
There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24:8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. As people try to recover from the impact of Cyclone Freddy, they also have to bury the dead. And as the rain continues, here in the village of Tauchira, they have to scoop water out of grave pits before laying the victims to rest. More than 320 people have now been confirmed dead, and thousands more are missing after the cyclone tore through southern Africa for a second time in weeks. Outside Malawi's commercial capital, Blantyre, people in this village have been cut off from their neighbors as roads and bridges lay in ruin. In some parts, there's no electricity or running water. We have people who, are, who have been rendered homeless. They don't have food, they don't have clothing, they don't have water, clean water. So it's really bad. We, 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 we don't even know what, what people are going to eat for lunch this, uh, today or even supper. We don't know because uh, um, we have not yet received any relief item as we speak. Across the country, more than 88,000 people have been displaced, with many sheltering in temporary camps. More rain is expected in the next few days, raising fears of flash floods and more destruction. Berta Santos is helpless. Under the rubble are her children's beds, her sofas and tables. She was only able to recover two pots, a cutting board and a toy. Everything is gone. The kitchen, everything. There is nothing left. Cardboard, wooden and tin homes were ravaged by two landslides that tore through the community of Rio Seco, southwest of the capital. More than a thousand homes were flattened and nearly 2,500 people affected. Wilber says his home was spared. It sits between his neighbor's brick walls. I'm so sad for those who have lost everything. It's nature. We can't find it. We never know when it's coming. The effects of Cyclone Yaku have been devastating in Peru's north and central coast. The capital, Lima, is on state of red alert. In this southwestern district of Cieneguilla, seven landslides happened simultaneously. 120 soldiers delivered water and food to survivors here. Heavy machinery cleared roads. The force of nature only spared the most solid constructions. For most of these poor Peruvians, their homes were all they had. And now even those are gone. Chunks of the main road linking Hasaka and Raqqa in northeastern Syria have been washed away. And in the fields around it, crops of wheat, barley and vegetables have been destroyed just as they would have been taking root. Heavy rains have raised river levels that have flooded homes as well as the tents of Syrians internally displaced by the civil war. I live alone as my husband is dead. The house flooded while I slept. My sons rescued me. All my possessions are wasted. I've lost everything. I only have the clothes on my back. We spent the whole night in the open. This region in Syria has been controlled by rebel forces for 12 years. There's not much maintenance of public roads, buildings and facilities. The area is home to around 4.5 million people, according to UN figures. 70% of them are in desperate need of humanitarian assistance. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, 
he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal, as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. I believe that time has arrived. Luke 17, 26 through 30. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Just in the days of Noah, when God sent a flood, and in the days of Lot, when God sent fire and brimstone to judge mankind, He is about to send His final judgments on a wicked and unrepentant world. To find out what parallels our days with the days of Lot, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 19, 1-5 now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. The term know them isn't a friendly handshake and how are you. It is to know them in a sexual way. What parallels our days with the days of Lot is homosexuality. The battle of the sexes has finally ended after several million years of jockeying and strife. Men won conclusively. We know this because yesterday was International Women's Day. That's the day we as a global community celebrate women. But if you looked closely at the women we were celebrating, you may have noticed a lot of them weren't actually women. They were lumpy looking dudes. And that was not accidental. In fact, it was a brilliant piece of sexual jujitsu. Sun Tzu could have written that strategy. Here you had men who are clearly craftier than they look, somehow convincing a whole lot of otherwise self-aware and highly educated women to praise them as living paragons of womanhood. Think about how, how hard it would be to sell that proposition. I'm going to steal your identity and then mock and degrade the immutable characteristics that define you as a person. And then as I do this, you are going to smile brightly and applaud and then give a speech about how liberated you feel. How about that? The whole thing is amazing. <clears throat> it's like watching a practical joke Think we get girls to fall for that? No way! They'll never buy it! Oh, but they did! They bought it, and it wasn't really that hard to sell it. Liberals will fall for anything if they think it is fashionable and progressive. Here's Jill Biden and Secretary Tony Blinken handing out an award on International Women's Day to a dude in makeup. In Argentina, Alba Ruada is a transgender woman who was kicked out of classrooms, barred for sitting for exams, refused job opportunities, subjected to violence, and rejected by her family. But in the face of these challenges, she worked to end violence and discrimination against the LGBTQI plus community in Argentina. Did you see Tony Blinken fight the natural urge to flinch as that guy kissed him? There's no flinching allowed on International Men in Dresses Day. That might spoil the intended message for the audience, which is, hey, ladies, meet you no hero. And they do welcome the guy. They clap like seals. Notice that all the women's awards these days seem to be going to men. Here you have Richard Levine put on an admiral's uniform with a skirt and become USA Today's Woman of the Year. William Thomas wears a one-piece bathing suit and gets nominated for NCAA Woman of the Year. Then some guy who calls himself Faye, with an E, was Hershey's Women's Day honoree, and so on. So the men are taking all the prizes set aside for women. But that's not all they're stealing. They're also taking what progressive called lived experiences. So anyone can throw on a halter top, but the real dividing line is biology. Only actual women can have menstrual cycles. Well, not anymore. 
Anything a woman can do, a man can do better. That's the slogan of the trans movement. And that includes getting cramps. Watch this. Why? Stop. Why is this thing not hot? I swear to God, if anyone says welcome to womanhood, I'm gonna lose my <laughs> Talk about mansplaining! That's the ultimate mansplaining! You're some guy, ladies, at a certain time each month. Your tummy may hurt a little. Let me tell you about it and what to do when that happens. It's too funny. Of course, if men can get their periods, by definition, they can also get pregnant. And that's why we need legal abortion. So men won't be forced into back alleys. Watch law professor Kira Bridges explain. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. Would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, um, and it opens up trans people to violence. Denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist. I'm is denying dangerous. that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking Are you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that the, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think. Women can get <laughs> so pregnant. you are denying that trans people exist. So here she is telling Senator Hawley, "Stop defending the matriarchy, Senator." Abortion is between a man and his doctor. Hands off men's bodies. Abortion is for the men. Ugh. Well, the media agree, by the way. So we've all been talking about what the Dobbs decision means for women, but it also matters for non-binary and trans birthing people. So I went to Atlanta, Georgia, to hear from one trans man about his experience with abortion. Do you believe then that men can become pregnant and have abortions? Yes. Trans men and non-binary people do become pregnant. So long as you have a uterus, you have the capability of getting pregnant. Um, and if you think that accessing abortion care is stigmatizing when you present as a woman, imagine what it is when you're presenting as your authentic male self. I appreciate your mentioning that there are transgender men and non-binary individuals who rely on reproductive health services and abortion services. We got them to make abortion all about men's bodies. <laughs> we got them to watch TikTok videos where some dude lectures them about menstrual cramps. <laughs> we got them to give all the ladies awards to men and feel virtuous as they were doing it. It is the funniest practical joke ever. Of course, it eliminated an entire category of humanity, women. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Romans 1.28-32 And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. The phrase debased mind is found in Romans 1.28, in reference to those whom God has rejected as godless and wicked. The Greek word translated debased is a dokimos, which means unacceptable, that is, rejected, by implication, worthless. The debased are those whom God has rejected and is left to their own devices. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? If his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning, my prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.